Well, amen. A lot of good uh, music this morning. The church is definitely blessed with many great musicians. Well, if you brought your Bibles with you, you can turn to the passage. You'll see it up there on the screen, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. John, chapter 20, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10. And the title of the message is, He Must Rise Again. If you are a guest with us, uh, you'll find the information in the bulletin on the inside. You can also look at the back for the outline of the sermon, and I'll touch on that in a few moments. But John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Recently, I read this following statement. It says, I'm a reader of biographies. And I noticed that almost all of them conclude with the death and burial of the subject. I have yet to read one that describes the subject's resurrection from the dead. It's an interesting comment, isn't it? Because when you think of a biography, it does just that. It describes the life of someone, whoever that particular person is. And more often than not, those describe the death of someone and their final days, if you will. The four Gospels give us Jesus' life. In other words, it gives us an account of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. But each one of them does, in fact, record the resurrection of Jesus. It has the resurrection of Jesus in each of the four Gospels. In Jesus' case, though, it isn't simply that he rose from the dead. Yes, he did, but he must rise from the dead. It wasn't something that was an option. It wasn't some sort of accident that Jesus went to the cross. In fact, Jesus' life story, as described in the four Gospels, state very matter of fact that he must rise again. But why? Why does he have to rise again? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Why is it that Jesus had to rise from the dead? And we're going to pick up from where we left off last week because at the end of last week's message, we come to despair. Do you know what despair is? It's the grave. And they left. And that's where Jesus was. And so most biographies would end there. Jesus' didn't. But why did he have to rise? If you want to follow along, again, if you're a guest with us, you have the outline on the back of the bulletin. And what we're going to find is on Sunday morning, you think of the Sabbath for the Jews, in verses 1 and through 2, and 1 and 2, we'll see the discovery of the empty tomb. Early at the break of dawn, they go and they discover something unique has happened. Then in verses 3 through 7, we'll see where Peter and John start to examine the tomb, and that's in verses 3 through 7. And it's very unique, just like the outside of the tomb. Then finally, we're going to look at verses 8 through 10. What does Scripture have to do with the empty tomb, or does it? In other words, what does Scripture have to say about the empty tomb? Uh, Again, remember, I've used this as an example, and I'm going to say it this last time. For God, there was no plan A. There was no plan B. This wasn't some sort of backup to the tragedy that happened. There was just a plan. And before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. And it was also determined that He would rise again. All of it happening in accordance with the Scripture. So how does this work? Let's start off, and we're going to read this in sections. So if you're not familiar with this, I'm going to explain the setting. But we're going to do this a little different. I'm going to read through each one of these as we go through it. So let's just read John chapter 20. Instead of reading the entirety of it, we're just going to read it in in its narrative form. Verses 1 and 2 first. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw that the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Now, if you're unfamiliar or don't know or just need a refresher, I used this last week. The Gospel of John has a unique structure to it. Of course, you have the beginning and the end, the prologue and the epilogue. But there are these two sections, I call them technically clumps. 
That's the formal way of saying it. It is these two pieces, these two units. And essentially you have the first 12 chapters that describe seven signs or miracles that Jesus did. One of which I alluded to earlier. And it's the last one. And he he raises Lazarus from the dead. I mean, this man, air quotes, has power over the grave. So all of these seven signs are given not so that you would have your best life today. It wasn't to fill up your bank account. In John chapter 20, the purpose for the seven signs is given. And what is it? It's what Martha said. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And when I believe in Jesus and what he has done, I have eternal life. Because this is the only way to have eternal life is to turn and trust in Christ. So all seven of them point to Jesus being the Son of God in the only means of salvation. But then in chapter 13, if you remember verse 1, everything turns on a dime. Thursday night, everything at that point pointing towards the crucifixion. So I told you last week, if you're not familiar with it, it's a pretty simple story, actually. Tragic, but simple. Jesus, of course, is convicted And he's sentenced to Roman crucifixion. The Roman soldiers take him, and they take him to the place of the skull, Golgotha. The Latin phrase, if you remember from last week, Calvarius is where we get the term Calvary from. We don't get Calvary from a church, we get it from the cross. And then from there, of course, we have Jesus' death on the cross. Now, of course, you know me well enough if you come each week. We're going to have a map. Jesus is crucified just outside what we might think of as the area there, which is pink. And he's taken to one of a few places and a few options. The star is what many may think of, but the skull there, if you look here today, and you can tell this wasn't the time of the disciples And you say, well, pastor, how do you know? Well, if you notice, there's tour buses over there. So this is not from that time, but if this is one of the places, and if you look in the center of it, it's almost like two eyes and a nose, and some suggest this is where it is. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus was crucified. He was, of course, then killed on Roman crucifixion. But what happens? If you weren't with us last week, I want to make sure that we're clear on what happened last week, because in case you weren't here, you need to understand there is this urgency to bury Jesus quick, really fast, if you were with us. Remember, it was a Sabbath that was coming up, and it was a high Sabbath because it was the week of Passover. So if Jesus was dead, in other words, he died somewhere in the afternoon, three-ish, They only have to sundown to get him buried, because otherwise it's a curse, a curse on the land and so forth. And so they hurry abruptly to get him down, and the way to speed it up is to break the legs of the three individuals. Remember, there were three that were crucified, two guilty and one innocent. They break the legs of the two, and when they come to Jesus, Jesus is already dead because he gave up his spirit. And he died. And so instead, what they do is they pierce him on the side, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 12. But you have this man, Joseph of Arimathea, who was rich. And he knew that they needed to hurry and to bury him. And so he purchases, if you will, this tomb. And he's able to be buried where? Just as the prophet Isaiah said, among the rich. I mean, Jesus had to be buried among the rich, not among the poor. Otherwise, Scripture can be broken, and God forbid it can't. And so everything that week was being done in accordance with God's Word. And I leave you with this one last comment on this. If all of that is true, and we still have this other that's going to be fulfilled in the future, we can be certain it's going to be fulfilled. And so he's buried in the rich man's tomb with the help of Joseph and Nicodemus. So as we move on here, we have Friday night on through Saturday, and hope has perished, isn't it? I mean, because men don't rise from the dead, do they? 
So as we picked up reading in verses 1 through 2 of John chapter 20, you'll notice there, and I have these notes if you want to take them, you can refer to them another time. But they come to the first day of the week. Now, the first day of the week, we say, oh, yeah, I mean, these are Americans, so it must have been Monday. No. Remember, this is a Jewish setting. The first day of the week, what day is it? It's the day that you're here. The early church eventually, in due time, began to call that what? It's the Lord's Day. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Why did and why should we gather? I thought of this this morning. Somebody came by my office and they had the, basically the same idea as I did. My friends, we gather not for ourselves on Sunday. We gather every Sunday to celebrate and reflect on the Lord Jesus Christ because He is alive forevermore. Our first priority is Jesus Christ Himself. Now, who is it that first comes to the tomb? Remember, the disciples scatter. Who comes to the tomb first? Well, here in John, you see where it's Mary, one of the many Marys. You know, could you imagine one time going to one of their meals and somebody said, is Mary here? And you have like six of them turn around. But in this case, you have Mary Magdalene. And what you see is she comes there first there. I want you to hold your place here and turn with me to Mark 16, 1, because I want you to look at something with me just briefly. Because remember... When Jesus is buried, they've got to hurry up. There's, there's no time for, if you will, pleasantries. They don't have very much time, so they have to hurry, wrap him up, get him situated, get him buried, because if not, sundown's coming. And so they've got to hurry. It's interesting, in Mark's account, Mark 16, 1, and I have both Matthew and Mark, but we're looking at Mark here, 16.1. You'll notice it says, when the Sabbath was over, so that would, of course, been why we end up with the day that we're talking about here, which is we think of as Sunday. But you'll notice there you have Mary and other Mary. But what did they do? They brought spices. And what was the purpose? So that they might come and anoint him. I've always loved that little small phrase there. Do you know what they were coming to do? To give him honor and to worship him. Isn't that amazing? Uh, these women who had been with Jesus throughout the vast majority of the three years, we say, ministry. And, and while the disciples fled for fear, and I understand these women were faithful, weren't they? And they came to honor and to came to worship Him. What did you come here this morning for? I don't know about you, but I came to honor and worship the risen King. They didn't have that full concept, but could you imagine how much they must have loved him? And they needed to tidy up, and they brought these elaborate spices, spices that were fit and due to a king, and so they come. And so we see these women were faithful to Jesus until the end, and unlike many others, they were faithful when it wasn't easy. You know, Christians today, we have a problem, and one of those problems is that we're faithful to Jesus when it's easy. We need to use these women's example and be faithful even when it's hard. Because following the Lord is not always easy, is it? And I think in our country today, it seems to be getting more and more difficult, but we need to endeavor to remain faithful. So who was there? So we know the women, and then what, do they, what does Mary do? So she goes to the tomb early, and then she runs and she finds Peter and John. Now how do we know it's John? Well, I mean, you're starting to narrow down here anyway, because you've already got Judas who's betrayed, so you don't have too many to pick from. But there's an easier answer. If you were to look in John 13, 23, we see where John refers to himself not by name. One of my favorite books of the Bible is the Gospel of John, and I've always appreciated that John does not use his name. How many of us would have done that? Oh yeah, that was me. That was Stephen, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John had such a humility, but he wanted people to know that he was the one that was loved by Jesus Christ. But what does Mary... And I want you to conceptualize this. She, she goes, and what does she discover when she goes there that day? Well, you'll notice two things are gone. 
Well, the first was when she goes and she reports to Simon and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which we know to be the Apostle John. You'll notice the way she phrases it and she describes two things are gone in effect or when she discovers it. The first thing is the stone is gone. Now, was the stone gone so Jesus could get out or was there for another reason? Turn with me to Matthew 28 and verse 2. Now, I have these cross-references up here in case you don't want to turn or you want to reference them later. Because when we put this together, this is just an amazing sequence of things that happen. Because I'll go ahead and tell you, Jesus didn't need any help getting out of the tomb. They needed help to come to find him gone. Now, if you go to Matthew 28 and verse 2, you'll find this little bit of a detail here. Matthew 28, verse 2, And behold, a severe earthquake happened just randomly, I guess, right? I mean, I mean, it just happened to be on the day that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. But notice what else. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, and he rolled away the stone, and he sat upon it. you got to love it. You've got these wicked, evil people that wanted to kill Jesus, to thwart what God had, And here is this angel almost laughingly thinking, you think this stone causes us a problem? And so they go there and they find that the stone is gone and it's gone away. And so this earthquake, this stone, and so the stone is gone. And we don't know in Mark. Mark just says, in effect, it's gone because she's able to see something. And we'll get to that in a moment. But most importantly, what does she focus on? Notice what she says, and I'm referring to John chapter 20 and verse 2, if you turned to Matthew. So when Mary goes and she tells Peter and John, notice what she says, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And I have no idea what happened to the Lord. Mine. My Lord. I mean, what happened? Well, you'll be drawn to the attention that she assumes that it's some sort of robbers, if you will. Someone had come and they had taken away the Lord. One of the things about this account of Jesus' resurrection and such is it's so real. If it was manufactured, everything would have lined up very perfectly, but there's a little bit of rawness here. Because her first reaction is the natural one, which is dead men don't rise from the grave. Someone must have came and stolen his body. And there was this problem in that day. And one of the main problems, which in, I believe it was around 142 uh, A.D., which was that there were grave robbers. They would go and they would rob graves and they would take, of course, things that were valuable. So it's natural for her to have thought this. Someone had come and taken away the Lord, A, because it was normal for that to happen, to steal things of value, but two, because dead men don't rise from the grave. Have you ever known someone to get up out of the grave and walk? So naturally she has this inclination that something is different because people don't come back from the dead. So let's pick up and read in the story and let's see what happens because, of course, she's gone to Peter and John and now they're going to hurry to see what happened. Pick up and read verses 3 through 7. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, in the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So as we begin looking here, you'll see what happens. And I want to draw your attention in particular to the reaction. So imagine Mary. She's been waiting to go. Of course, there's the other ladies that would have gone there. They were going there to go her honor, to worship the Lord with the spices. And she discovers not only that the stone is gone, But the Lord is gone as well. So she goes and she finds Peter and John. 
And you'll notice their reaction. They run. I mention this because you have people today that like to deny the resurrection of Jesus. And one of those arguments is that the disciples stole the body. Have you ever heard that before? Bogus. Because you know why? Why would you run? I mean, you knew where he is. I wouldn't have run. I would have thought to myself, yeah, well, we stole the body. I mean, why run? So they run because they're thinking to themselves, what in the world happened? There is this, I use the word rawness to the account because it's so raw, it's accurate. Do you understand? Because this is a natural reaction. Mary would have naturally thought, dead men don't rise from the grave. I know he said he would, but it just couldn't happen, could it? And then when Peter and John find, they're thinking to themselves, what in the world happened? And so they run. And who got there first? The fastest one. Now, I have to tell you, this one has always amused me. And if you don't like this humor... Well, then it's all right. When your turn is to teach on it, you can skip it. But couldn't you imagine Peter saying to John, are you sure the Holy Spirit told you to put in there that you were faster than me? Are you sure? But that's how he got there. So that's the trick question of the day. How did John beat Peter to the grave? Because he's faster. And if I were Peter, I would have wished he hadn't put it in there. But in all seriousness, let's be moving to now what happens. So John doesn't go in initially, if you notice. It's Peter. Had to be Peter, didn't it? Uh, If you don't know if you notice the nuance of the language here, John doesn't go in. He just looks. Peter had to go in. And then John will follow him. Now what do they find? If you don't grasp Anything else, pay attention to what they find. Because people like to say this was all a hoax. And I can show you very easily using the Greek how this isn't the case. So the first thing you'll notice, of course, is when they go in there, and this, of course, is Peter, who else would go in there first? It has to be Peter, doesn't it? So when they go in there, you'll know where I'm drawing this from is verses 5 and 6 initially. So there's these linen wrappings. So they would have wrapped up Jesus' body. This is what we looked at last week at the end of John 19. But something is being distinguished here. And I have it up there as a face cloth. How many of you men use a handkerchief? I do. It's curious here because you'll notice that there is a description and a distinction between the wrappings and the face cloth. Think of a handkerchief if that helps you just visualize it. I'm not saying that that's what it is, but think about it that way. You'll see where when John describes what they find there in verse 7, notice the very end. That the face cloth was rolled up in a place by itself. So there are these wrappings that are in its place, but there is, just think of a handkerchief. Don't come to me afterwards and say, Pastor, it's not a handkerchief. I know it's not. But that's sort of the idea of what I want you to picture here. In the Greek, to roll up something means to take it, fold it, and properly place it in a neat fold. I'm not following you. I have handkerchiefs. I have handkerchiefs because as a pastor, people come see me and they cry (laughs) sometimes. So you got to have a handkerchief. If you go to my house, there's two types of foldings that occur. When I fold it, it looks like a robber did it. (laughs) When Merritt does it, she lays it out, she irons it, she folds it again, and she irons it, and she folds it. And it's in this perfect crease. Let me ask you, do robbers do that? Or do they leave it because they've got to hurry up and get out of there? In the Greek, it means to fold nicely and to crease and lay gently in its place. Robbers don't do that, my friends. So what is being described here is not a hurried, not a rushed. It's almost like he just, poof, passed through it. Is that possible? Could Jesus just pop through and go through something? 
Turn with me to John 20, if you're not with us, and I want you to look at verses 19 and 26 with me. Because if Jesus is no longer restrained by stone and wrappings, he has no problem getting out of that tomb, does he? Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is one of the many appearances that occur over 40 days. Jesus selectively appeared to people over a period of 40 days. But I just want you to see how he approaches the disciples in 19 and 26 of John 20. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, notice, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, Shalom, peace be with you. How did he get in if everything was locked up? Notice verse 26. In case you didn't get it the first time, he's coming back again. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Did you not believe me the first time? Peace be with you. Do you understand what I'm trying to get across here? Jesus is not inhibited by physical boundaries any longer. So is the stone a problem for him? Not a chance. The stone was rolled away so someone could go in there and see that he wasn't there. Jesus was already gone because, poof, he's no longer restrained by physical boundaries anymore. I'm going to read something to you. I do not want you to leave here thinking that someone robbed the body. The Greek language is describing to you very abruptly that the wrappings were placed just as though someone vanished through it. And it's almost like an angel came and just folded his face cloth just right and laid it right where it was supposed to. So robbers didn't come. The disciples didn't come. He just vanished. Notice what it says. If grave robbers had removed the body, they would have undoubtedly taken the expensive cloth which which Joseph and Nicodemus had prepared for the burial. Remember last week? It was a rich man. And Jesus was buried like a king. It goes on and it says, A grave robber would not have taken the time to fold the head covering neatly, but would have left it lying in a heap. And they would have hurried away from the tomb as quickly as possible to avoid being apprehended by the guards. Because I tell you right now, if I had done it, I would have been running quick. What would it have looked like, though, if that really was Jesus in the body? Lastly, before we move on, Look back at the passage that I read earlier this morning in John 11, because this is what Jesus should have looked like, but didn't. John chapter 11, I read this morning. How many of you have heard of Lazarus? Died. Jesus spoke, said, come forth. How did he come forth, though? I mean, did he just vanish through the wrappings and the cloth? Notice what it says, John chapter 11, verses 43 through 44. And when Jesus had said these things, this is when he said, come out. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Notice how Lazarus appears when he comes out of the tomb. The man had died, came forth, bound hand and foot with, notice, wrappings. And his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said, you better unbind him so he can be free. That's how Jesus would have appeared. And the wrappings would have just been all over the place. The face cloth would have been left to strew. They probably would have found it out somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Where was it? What was the empty tomb? What did they discover when they examined the tomb? That everything was neat and precise. Almost like someone had just gone right through it. Just like he would... A few days later, and just like he would eight days later. So something extremely unique had occurred. The stone was not removed to let Jesus out. It was to begin to let people see that he was no longer there. 
that he had risen from the dead, and then in his resurrected body, walls, stone, nothing would inhabit, inhibit him again. But did all of this just sort of happen, or was God fully aware of it, what was going to happen? Let's finish reading the passage, and this is John 20, our last part of the verses, verses 8 through 10. So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered. So this is John. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. So clearly they discover by examining the tomb that it was empty and something special has happened. But we need to make sure we understand here what is happening isn't something random, but actually was a fulfillment of God's word. All through the week, beginning with the triumphal entry, all the way to the resurrection, all the way to the ascension, God's word was precisely being filled all the way along and that God was fully aware of what was happening. Now, what happens? So John goes in and seeing is believing, isn't it? Jesus predicted that he would rise again from the dead. This is really important to understand. A lot of people glaze over this, gloss over this. Haters of the scripture, I call them. Because what we find is, is that the Bible foretells what he's going to do. If you've been with us on Sunday nights, you know that in the Gospel of Mark, there are three predictions and they get more precise as time goes on. I have it up there for you. I'm just going to read it for time's sake. It's Mark 9.31. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And that happened, didn't it? Do you know what he said else? And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Jesus went in the tomb before sundown Friday. All day Saturday, and at the break of dawn, he just, gone. But what does the Scripture say about it? The Scripture, if you notice back in John 20, says in verse 9, For as yet they did not understand that he must rise again. What makes biblical Christianity, the reason why I say biblical Christianity is there's a lot of faux, false Christianity today. Mormonism is not Christianity. They believe in another Jesus. There is a slew of people who think they are Christians while all the while they don't believe in Jesus Christ. They worship everything else but Jesus. My friends, there is one mediator between man and God, and I'll tell you who he is. It is not a pastor. It is not a priest. It is not Mary. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Jesus is the only means of salvation. And so that is what the Scripture is teaching here. And as they come to the understanding, the understanding is that not only that they were told this, but it is a fulfillment of Scripture. So what you have here is you have John and Peter who begin to have the light bulb come on. Have you ever had that happen before? Have you ever been reading the Bible and it's just sort of starting to click? It's starting to click and starting to click. What you will find is years later, Peter comes to the understanding of verse 9, which is that the scriptures foretold of his resurrection. We're not going to turn here before we finish. Psalm 16, 10 says that the Messiah would rise from the dead. Peter, years later finally gets it. Turn with me before we finish to Acts chapter 2. Because there's something unique that happens in Acts chapter 2. It's Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes, and then they begin to fully grasp the Scripture. You, You understand that's the same for you. If you are here without Jesus Christ, don't expect to understand much of the Scripture. You need the Holy Spirit to enable you to understand it. But years later... Peter quotes from Psalm 16 in verse 10, right after Pentecost in his sermon. You find this, I have the entirety of the passage, we won't read it. We're going to just pick up and read some of it. Peter in his sermon, 
I have it up there for you, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading verse 25. For David says of him, this is David meaning in the Psalter, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. This is the passage he's quoting from. Notice verse 27. Because you will not abandon my soul to hell, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. That is the reference to Psalm 1610. The Psalms declare that the Messiah would die on the cross for the sins of the world. They would also be buried. But the Old Testament also teaches that He would rise again. Why, you say, is that important? Because God was fully aware of everything that was going to happen to the Messiah. He would die, He would be buried, and He would rise again one day. So obviously there was evidence that the tomb was empty, wasn't it? But the most important thing I want you to see here is that God's Word is being fulfilled because you and I today can't see the empty tomb. What you and I have is the biblical revelation that describes all of this. And so the story is told. And we are to trust and believe that Jesus died in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried, but He also rose again. You ever wonder why they leave the tomb? Why would you stay there? He's not there anymore and He's not coming back. That's what verse 10 is teaching you. He wouldn't be going back again. He was gone. See, Jesus' life is unique, isn't it? Biographies record the birth, the life, and the death of people. Only Jesus' story describes His resurrection. And when we go out and preach the gospel, to leave those elements out is to preach another gospel. You understand that you and I are dead in our trespasses and sins. And the only way to have salvation is to do what? Believe in the contents of the gospel. What are the contents of the gospel? Notice what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians Because if you don't believe this, my friends, you are still dead in your trespasses and sins because you haven't believed in the gospel. Notice what it says. For I delivered to you as of first importance. How could that be most important? Because otherwise it's like me. If I don't deliver to you first importance, the gospel, you're still dead. Notice what Paul says. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. How? Why? Why? according to the Word of God. And that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day. Why? Because the Bible said so. God's Word was being fulfilled in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And to believe in that is to have eternal life. If you are trusting in anything else, you have not trusted in the good news of the grace of God. And why would you not want to do that today of all days? So why must he rise from the dead? Because Pastor Pace said it? Nope. Because the Bible said it. And God's word is always going to come true. Father, I fear we have grown numb to the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Father, I pray today that if anyone is here today, they understand that Jesus did not need to rise again because of me. He didn't need to rise again for any other reason other than the Scripture declared that He would. And when you declare something in your Word, Lord, it's going to come to fulfillment. There's not an option for your Word not to be fulfilled. As we saw last week, Jesus died in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried just as Joseph of Amir of Amathea was fulfilling in accordance with your Scriptures. He also rose again in accordance with David in Psalm 16, among many others. Father, I pray that none of us leave here today thinking that Easter is about anything other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Because when John saw Jesus once again on the island of Patmos, Jesus said, I have died, but behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. In other words, I decide where people go. I decide the eternal faith 
and fate, and it's based on what they believe in me. Lord, I pray that each person here today has trusted in the good news of Jesus Christ and has eternal life. And Father, that we go forward reminding, unlike every other false religion in the world, what makes biblical Christianity distinguished is that our Savior is alive forevermore and He is no longer in the tomb. And that is what we trust in today. Lord, I pray we take this message out as we leave and not simply keep it in the walls of the church and that you have been glorified in all that we have done today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.